Good morning slash afternoon, Nye River students. It is Wednesday, Wednesday the 20th of January. We're here today to help you with your study guide for your CFA quiz or test rather that will be on Friday. 15 so sure, questions. Yeah, 15 questions. So there's not a lot of room for error. We want all of you to do well on this. Can you see my screen on your end, Mr. Wagner? You better believe it. All right, very good. So our first question is, is talking about on our study guide, list three more reasons for westward expansion. So we give you two of them. Opportunity for African-Americans, new technology such as trains and the railroad, and Mr. Wagner, what would three more be? If you look at my screen here, I've got the uh, graphic organizer we did together in class. Yeah, that's from a long time ago. Uh, yeah. The biggest one would be free land, yeah. getting that free land on the, uh, the Great Plains, opportunity for wealth. Yeah. And that uh, spirit of adventure. So those are three more. Yep, absolutely. So guys, this is accessible to you. This is in Google Classroom. You'll just have to go dig it up. Or if you were a good student and took it down in your notebook, you'll have it right in your notebook. We did this together in class a couple months ago. But we're going to have a study guide, right, Mr. Dawson, on this too? Yeah, well, this is the study guide. We're going through it right now. Yep. So this is going to help them complete it. All right. Next question, and let me pull up another organizer for you. Let's see what this one is. Mr. Wagner, list two reasons why Native American population declined during westward expansion. Yeah, and there's usually a, like a little bar graph that shows smaller bars that shows the population declining, but the biggest reasons are warfare, some of those battles, and then disease. So warfare and disease. Yeah, those are the things that really drove the Native American population down. And like Mr. Wagner said, you're going to see a bar graph going down. And that's because of disease and warfare had a terrible effect on the Native American population. All right. Again, this uh, graphic organizer, we did it together in class. Go back and find it and reference it. Make sure you know the stuff on it. Okay. Number three, after the Civil War, immigration increased and more people moved to the city called urbanization. This caused overcrowding and many people were forced to live in crowded ghettos and these apartments, better known as what? What is that, Mr. Wagner? And they would be tenements. Yeah. So tenement buildings, so apartment complexes. And like you said, Mr. Dawson, overcrowded, filthy. Yeah. So the end of the new, newly arriving immigrants were often forced to live inside these tenements because that's all what, that was available. So if uh, Mr. Mr. Wagner and I had a similar profession or if we maybe both of us were Germans coming from Germany, we would live in a tenement house together. Maybe us and two or three or four or five other people. And it got so crowded. I think another reason for the crowds, you know, all the immigrants coming in, that was the urbanization. So yeah. rapid urbanization. For sure. And then when people segregated themselves based on ethnicity, so all the Italians lived in one place, the Germans lived in another place. What's that called again, Mr. Wagner? That's called the ghetto because you're comfortable being around, you know, your culture. Yep. So ghettos and, and tenements. Okay. All right. We got some definitions on number four. Define. What's urban mean? That'd be big city. Big Living city. in a city. Yep suburbs so that's right outside a city so we're we're actually in a suburb right now outside like in a subdivision right right and then rural rural that's way that? out in way out in the country way out in the country right okay good list two more reasons why people immigrated to the u.s after the civil war we've got adventure and opportunity here let me go find this graphic organizer that we did together. Again, this should be in your notebook. So here we go. Reasons why immigration increased after the Civil War. We've got adventure and opportunity already there for you. So we we'll want two more Freedom and escape from oppressive government. So oppressive means a government that has total control over the people. So when they are escaping an oppressive government, they're going from a government where you have no freedom to the United States, which has a democracy where people have freedom. For sure. Okay. Very good. And religious freedom was big because in Europe, sometimes you could not worship or uh, 
you had to follow a specific religion that was mandated by the government, so people were getting away from that. Very good. Again, you should have this organizer in your notebook. All right. All right, next, list the correct industry with the proper captain of industry. Let's look at this thing that we did a long time ago. Here we go. All right, go ahead and get through these for us, Mr. Wagner. Yeah, we got the John G. Rockefeller and his uh, industry was oil. Remember, he tried to control all the oil with a monopoly. We have uh, Vanderbilt, Cornelius Vanderbilt. He was real big with railroads and shipping. We have Andrew Carnegie, who was big with steel. What city comes to mind with steel? Pittsburgh. Yeah. Pittsburgh. Yeah. yeah. J.P. Morgan with banking. And finally, the easiest one, Henry Ford with automobiles. That's we right. have an inventor up there too, uh, Thomas Edison, electrification, light bulb. Yeah. Let's do this together for you real quick. So the automobile goes with Ford. The light bulb would go with Edison. The money, the banking, that's J.P. Morgan. Oil. The transportation goes with Vanderbilt. We'll put it up here. The steel industry goes with Carnegie. And the oil, oil industry with John D. Rockefeller. Yep. All right. So refresh your memories on those. You're going to have a question about those guys, okay? So, you, again, you can go back and find this in your Google Classroom. This is You might have to dig around for it a little bit, but it's there. All right? Next, what was the purpose of the progressive movement? So let's look. Let's go find the organizer we did together. There we go. Go ahead, Mr. Wagner. We wanted to improve. The progressive movement wanted to improve society. So some of the areas that they touched on was labor, all the problems, the negative effects, so those long hours, um, low pay, child labor, terrible working conditions. To fix that, they're going to form a labor union. So don't forget that. That was the solution, was to form a labor union to improve working conditions. And I think we had a couple of amendments. I know we had the 18th, which was... Uh, the alcohol, but what was the other amendment, the 19th, that dealt with suffrage? Yep, the 19th Amendment uh, granted women the right to vote, otherwise known as women's suffrage. Yep. So the progressive movement as a whole wanted to improve society. Right, Mr. Wagner? Yes. Okay. I think we're on to the Spanish-American War, Mr. Dawson. We're getting close. Remember the labor unions. That's how uh, workers... Um, join together to work for better working conditions, better pay, and that sort of thing. They would bargain, go on strike. Yeah. All right. Did we talk about the 18th Amendment? What was the 18th Amendment, Mr. Wagner? That's the temperance movement, so dealing with alcohol. Yeah. And, of course, yeah. the 19th, women's right to vote. Yep. The 18th Amendment banned the sale of alcohol. All right. Yellow journalism. What is yellow journalism? So that's Spanish-American War, and that's the newspapers exaggerating the news, trying to sensationalize the news, sometimes putting out fake news to try to sway public opinion. And they're going to use that a lot when it comes to the Spanish-American War to get the United States to go to war with Spain. Yep. Here is another one of our organizers that we did together. Here we got yellow journalism down at the bottom, exaggerated news against Spain. Very good. The, so again, I guess a good example was the, when the main sunk, immediately yellow journalism, before they even had any evidence or proof, they blamed it all on Spain. Correct. Correct. Now, after the war was over, so let's say the war's won, we run, won it very rapidly within a couple of months. How did the world perceive us after we had defeated Spain so easily? The U.S. is going to emerge as a world power. So that means that we're now going to have a lot of influence over other countries because our Navy, our military has gotten a lot stronger. So that world power. Absolutely. We emerged as a world power. Very good. 
Let's talk about Teddy Roosevelt for a minute. I don't know that I have an organizer for him that we did together on hand, but what was the name of his his type of diplomacy? How did he deal with foreign countries? Well, he would use uh, the Navy to back up or show force, and he called it, if you've got the Navy, you've got strength, it was called that big stick diplomacy. Big so stick diplomacy. Diplomacy. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's, that went along with the Roosevelt corollary, but for the for this test here, they really need to know the big stick diplomacy. Very good. The All right, guys, you're, you're going to need to know your central powers from World War One. and guess what? We did do an organizer on that together. Mm -hmm. You should have it right in your notebooks. If not, it's in classroom. Yours will look something like this. We've got the allies down the left and the central powers down the right. Okay. So there's four central powers you need to know and six allies. Right. And Germany's the strongest central power. Austria Hungary, Bulgaria, Ottoman Empire. Yep. So those are the four you really need to know. That is correct. All right. Let's see. Moving on to Wilson's 14 points. We did a real abbreviated. We didn't make you memorize every one of the 14 points, guys. But we gave you the highlights of it. And we basically need you to understand what the purpose behind the 14 points was about. Go ahead, Mr. Wagner. So Wilson, President Wilson, while the war was still going on, knew the, the Allies were going to win, and he came up with this peace plan. And he was a kind of person, idealistic, meaning, you know, he wanted to have an ideal world. He wanted to promote world peace and make sure we never had another war. So the 14 points, a peace plan, and it included the League of Nations. Absolutely. So Wilson wanted to form the League of Nations. Now, after the war was over and we had won, the, meaning the Allies, um, did the United States join the League of Nations, Mr. Wagner? No, they did not. Wilson came up with it, wanted the U.S. to join, but the American people said, no, we're going to be staying out of Europe's problems. We want to be isolationist. Yep, that's correct. And then talk about let's talk about the Treaty of Versailles, which was actually the formal document that ended the war and set the terms of the end of the war and how things are going to work after that. Um, let's see if I can find the Treaty of Versailles real quick. Here we go. There it is, guys. Treaty of Versailles, there's some main points. It's the document that ended the war. It was really negative against Germany. Germany lost land. They were only allowed to keep a small military force. They had to accept blame for World War, World war I. And they had to pay reparations. So they had to give money to France and Belgium, in, uh, to be specific, and some of the other allies. So know that the United States did not sign off on, on the Versailles Treaty. We did not agree with the Treaty of Versailles. And you guys are going to see on the quiz, it's going to say the U.S. didn't ratify the Treaty of Versailles. What's that mean, Mr. Dawson? Yeah, ratify just means to approve it, to accept it. We did not, okay? So we we did not accept it. So we didn't accept the treaty or uh, the League of Nations? No, no. All right. Now, we talked a little bit in our online lesson from the 19th about um, the automobile and how it changed life in America. So one of the main things was that the automobile allowed people to move from the city, from urban areas, to where, Mr. Wagner? To the suburbs, and that's the area right outside of the city. So that's where that great mobility comes in, gave, yeah. gave people great mobility to move to the suburbs right outside of cities. Many of your parents, unfortunately for them, they have to hop in a car and drive north every day. They either go to D.C. or they drive south to Richmond. They commute, they go back and forth from the suburbs to the urban area, to the cities. And the automobile makes that possible. Okay. Talking about the automobiles still, who was our inventor again? Our big, important captain of industry we learned about? And that would be Henry Ford. And, and then he was able to take and mass produce this Model T, the car for the common man. And what, what manufacturing method did they use that was really uh, really produced these these Model Ts in high numbers? Yeah, Henry Ford really um, developed and used the assembly line process, guys, which 
did a few things. It lowered the cost of the car because it could make, be made faster and cheaper. And it, uh, that in hand uh, allowed the average American to be able to afford a, an automobile. Um, that's pretty much all we need to know on it, I believe, guys. So you need to know over time, the assembly line caused the cost of an automobile to go down. Okay. So instead of just Mr. Dawson making a car all by himself, you can imagine how long that would take because I'd never really get good at every um, aspect of making a car. But if all I have to do is put the mirrors on and I put the mirrors on all day, I get really good at it. I get really fast at it. Okay. So that allowed the cost of the automobile to go down over time and made it affordable. So guys, that is it. We're going to have a quizzes for you to do on Thursday during class. We want study you to guide. Do yeah, we're doing the study guide. We just went over it with you. Um, you have your notes, which I've referenced here today. You can go back and dig these up out of your notebook or they're on Google Classroom. Again, it will take a little bit of searching on your part, but they are in there. And that's pretty much it. You good, Mr. Wagner? Very good, sir. Okay, let me stop recording here. We'll see you guys in class soon.